Now, we've been talking some on Wednesday night about um, divine prosperity, a prosperity with a purpose. Um, last week, we went a little different direction, and that was um, talking about casting your cares upon the Lord. Now, God always knows when to give us a timely word. I would like to think that every word we get from God is a timely word. God's not off timing. Amen. He's an on time God. Amen. So prosperity is something that we will always teach um, in systematically as the Lord, because that's one of the things we're called to teach, to raise up entrepreneurs and millionaires. Amen. It doesn't mean you start one, but you got to think like one before you can be one. Praise the Lord. Amen. Tonight, though, I'm going to give you just some, a little bit digress, just a little bit in a different direction. I want to give you some keys to um, keys to having personal and private revival in your own life or, or keys to having personal and private victory. You could say it like that. There's too many Christians that walk around with no victory. Too many Christians that if you look at them side by side with the world, they act the same, look the same, sound the same. But, but the Bible says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are supposed to walk in victory or be victorious in every situation. We are supposed to have such a unified, victorious church that no power or enemy's plan can come against it. Amen. Isaiah 54 verse 17. I want to start there. This is where you've got to start from, not finish at. It says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now that's weapons spiritually, weapons physically, weapons emotionally, weapons in any area. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, if you don't believe that and speak it and act like it, then you can fall prey to weapons that are formed against you that seem to be prospering. I see a lot of Christians that seems like weapons are formed against them and they're prospering. But the Bible says they shall not. So if the Bible says they shall not, then God needs your agreement with what he said in order for you to win. Look at it real simply like this. The devil's against you. God's for you. Your vote decides the outcome. Your confession, your actions, your obedience decides the outcome. God's always for you. The devil's always against you. God and the devil aren't working together behind the scenes like in some cooperative to get you to do something. God's on your side. The devil's not. God is light. The devil is darkness. Your vote determines the outcome. So no weapon formed against you, the believer, or me, the believer, shall prosper. That's not enough just to believe that. You also have to declare that. You have to get up in the morning and go, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. When the devil launches an attack, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You got to believe it. Say it till you believe it. Believe it till you say it. Say it till you believe it. Amen? Amen? And then it says, every tongue who rises against you in judgment or in condemnation or to pronounce something over your life that's not what God says, it says you shall condemn it or shut it down. When you condemn, when the government or a city condemns a property... What do they say? No legal activity here. No, you can't live here. So you have to say to weapons, words, and thoughts that the devil sends against you, you're condemned. You're not coming into the, you are a condemned word. You can't come against me and prosper. You condemn it. But if you don't condemn it, if you allow it, if you condone it, rather than condemn it, You give it permission to continue to operate and build a house there. And the enemy tries to get you to agree with him. But the word says no weapon formed against me shall prosper. So I declare no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up, be it the devil's tongue, be it the enemy's tongue, be it some other person's tongue that's coming against the move, plan, and purpose of God, that shall, I condemn that. Or I do not allow that to exist in my sphere. 
That work is condemned. That word is condemned. Put down. Brought to damnation. That's where the word be damned comes from. I mean, people go, be damned. They don't know it, but they're speaking damnation. I'm like, oh, you said a curse word. They actually just spoke damnation. And the, the audacity of, of someone to say, God. We just think it's a slang word, and that's what it turned into for most people. But you're, in, in its purest form, people are saying for God to damn something. If people don't understand the power of the spoken word, God doesn't damn things to begin with. God blesses. What well, God is blessed, let no man curse. There are certain things that God has put his curse on, the curse, not the curse of God. There is a place in the Bible that talks about the curse of God. But God's not going around cursing things. I curse you, I curse you. You open the door through seed time and harvest. God put blessing and cursing in the earth. It's up to you how it comes. Amen? When people say the curse of the Lord and reading that in Scripture, it's not like God said, well, I'm cursing you, I'm cursing you, I'm cursing you, I'm blessing you, I'm cursing you. No, it's seed time and harvest. People reap what they sow. And the law of blessing and cursing was put in there. It's like this. If I told you, if I told Noah, Noah, if you go out into the street, there are cars out there. There are traffic running. And if he of his own will went out into the street and got in the middle out there and was crying, going, oh, I don't know how to go back, that would be his fault because he didn't, he didn't take the advice. He went out there and was just standing around crying in the middle of the street, didn't know which way to go. Now, I would go rescue him. But if I was his mom or daddy, I'd probably paddle his behind real good for disobeying me and going out in the street. Because why? If you disobey, a curse can come. One time we had somebody who came, who, who um, a long time ago, came up to the church, brought their dog and tied them to a, to a fence, um, a, a bench out there. Tied this big old dog to a bench. And went inside in the church. This was probably 10 years ago. But, and the dog got excited and started running and started pulling the bench. I guess it wasn't the one out there, obviously. But um, it ran all the way out in the street. And a truck ran over it. Now then, you know, that so, that so we know that there's danger if you get in the street in the wrong place, wrong time. But if you tell your kids don't run out in the street and they do it and get in danger, the reason you, don't, you would punish them was because you don't want them to get run over. You want that to remember. So the curse was given so that people would realize there are consequences to wrong, sin, and disobedience. Some of those consequences are condemnation, opens the door to the enemy's con condemnation. Some of it can be, um, you know, sickness and disease. God didn't send it with that intent, but he has to allow it because whatever we allow or open the door to, through the law of seed, time, and harvest, he has to allow it because he's made you and I free moral agents, given us the ability to decide and declare, to condemn, to bless, to curse, to bring in, to kick out. Matthew 18, 18, what does it say? It says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Or what you ever, what you enforce, or you could say what you condemn, tie up, bring down, don't allow on earth, heaven backs you and won't allow it. In other words, your words determine what heaven does. See, that's hard for people who are raised sovereignty-minded with God. That God's a big God up in heaven. He does whatever He wants. You can pray, but it really don't matter because, you know, God's going to do what He wants to. That's not really encouraging for prayer people. You can pray, but God's going to do what He wants to do. No, but in heaven, God does what we pray according to faith. If we pray it according to the will of God, we have the answer. And God delights to answer. But it also says whatever you Allow, one translation says, Matthew 18, 18, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, but whatever you loose 
How many people have loosed the curse with their words? How many people have loosed the curse with their with, with their attitude, with their thoughts. How many of y'all know that whenever, every day, you're loosening or binding? Yeah, right. Every day, you, the believer, with authority, are loosing or binding things that are attached or repelled away from you. If you loose the curse in your life, if you're loosening it, loosening it, loosening it, loosening it, heaven has to say, I have to allow it because they're allowing, they're calling for it. But if you bind, you say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Heaven's like, whoop, there's some word I can work with right there. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. Protection angels, on the scene. Victory angels, on the scene. What the devil meant for a... Diversion, a nightmare, a car wreck, a house fire, a, a, a tornado, a something, sickness, disease, symptom, angels. They say no weapon formed against them shall prosper. So I have to do what they do. I have to back what they say. But if you as a believer with authority in your tongue say, I just don't know about it. I just feel so depressed. I just feel weak. I feel bad. You know, sometimes I just think I'm possessed by the devil. My mind. I just don't know. I'm just so confused all the time. Why doesn't the Lord hear my prayers? Doesn't seem like he hears them. What just happened is you loosed something that by the law of heaven and seed time and harvest, God says, I don't really like those words, but I bound myself to my own words. So I have to allow that in your life. And then people get all things of all sorts of harvest they don't want or don't like. And they begin to say, why, Lord, why? And the devil's right there to tell them, well, this is God's will, or this is that, or sometimes God will, sometimes he won't, sometimes he does, sometimes he don't. And all sorts of erroneous and false doctrines have been built without the understanding of this one particular thing, that whatever you loose on earth as a believer, God will loose that from heaven to back you. Whatever you bind on earth as a believer, God looses that from heaven to back you. It shifts it to a whole nother level. Growing up, we didn't hear this. We didn't know it. There was some teaching on the authority of the believer in the 70s that came through the, some circles of the um, denomination I was raised in. But it wasn't widely taught or widely understood. People prayed prayers like this. Lord, grant me the grace to accept things I don't understand and the serenity to do. Y'all have seen those, the serenity prayers and all. I mean, that sounds real good, very poetic and very, but, but it's not accurate New Testament believer reality. It's not. So let's not post that. Let's not like that. Let's not share that. Let's not be, because when you're saying that, you're saying, okay, God, there might be some things I don't understand, and, and I just don't understand. Don't, don't, don't. And I'm not saying you understand everything. Paul said, we were pressed down but not destroyed, struck down but not destroyed, persecuted but not abandoned, perplexed but not in despair. Paul didn't say, well, I'm just perplexed. Lord. Lord, help me, Jesus. I'm so perplexed. I mean, I'm I'm kind of surprised there's no Christian song out there called Perplexity. I don't know what's happening for the life of me. I don't know what I will ever be. My life is filled with perplexity. You know, just something like, I mean, how, how often do we not realize that the fruit of what we've been saying 
It's what is growing in our life. And if we don't like the things that we're seeing growing, then let's go back to the reality of we planted those words. Maybe three months ago, maybe three years ago, maybe you've been planting words for three decades. So when the Bible says, and this is one key to personal victory, a personal revival in your own life. To not say things that you don't want to happen. When you understand your words carry weight, your words come to pass. And even as a believer, even word, faith, believers can put it on autopilot and start living not by their daily confession, not by their words, not, not by, they just kind of just start walking, you know, well, praise the Lord. You know. And then something happens, you go, whoa! And then you realize that, wait a minute, that door is open for a reason. Maybe I neglected to shut it. Maybe I didn't do this. May, and those sometimes when, when weapons are prospering against you, don't just automatically assume, well, I don't know why. I don't know why. why am I? No, wait, stop. Go, wait a minute now. If the Bible says no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and there are weapons that seem to be prospering, where have I loosed the ability for that weapon to be formed? It didn't say it wouldn't be formed. It said it wouldn't prosper. The devil's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So if he has to ask permission, Satan's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he, 1 Peter 5, verse 7 and following. Isn't it right in there? Resist him steadfast in the faith. Satan's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If he has to ask permission, I mean, why, why did the Holy Ghost say that seeking whom he may, may? May. That means he may not. Not at his will. Mother, may I go over to my friend's house and play in the um, swimming pool? No, you may not. See, may not trumps may. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil. And real clear, who's the adversary? Is God your adversary? Now, can God resist you? Yes. What does he resist? The proud. It says in that same passage of Scripture, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Go back two verses to verse 6. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care on him, for he cares for you. We, we camped on that last week. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your devil, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may or can or will allow him. May means you must have permission. It's permissive. You have to, you're asking for permission. May we go to the movies this Friday night? You're asking permission. The devil, may I devour you? Well, how does he have access or how does he have permission? Whatever we permit, he, heaven permits. Whatever you bind or don't allow or don't permit, heaven will back you and not permit. So when you give permission through your confession of faith or fear, heaven is bound by Scripture to allow it or not allow it based upon what you say. So here's what it says. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. Go back to verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So that means he can't just devour you anytime he wants to. By your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Hallelujah. So several keys here to personal victory or personal revival is, um, you know, I've got several of them. If I give them to you, um, one is, is saying the same thing consistently. 
If you speak based on your feelings day to day, you're going to give permission to the devil to devour, to steal, kill, and destroy, and to prosper against you. If you can come to church and shout victory, but you go home and you're not feeling victory, so you shout defeat or say defeat. Your words, if you speak with forked tongue or out of both sides of your mouth, you know, that's what people used to say. That's what Indians used to say about the government that would promise them stuff. White man speak with forked tongue. What does it mean? It's one way here, one way there. Double tongued, double minded. If you will center your speech up with what God's word says. Don't allow your mouth to speak what you don't want because whatever you speak, you are calling for and giving permission to be. Say, for example, sickness comes against your body and you start feeling a little symptomatic. Most people were taught their whole life growing up just kind of like, well, this is kind of just going to have to ride this out a while. Whether it's flu, bug, 24-hour, whatever. And you just kind of prepare. Rather than to get up immediately and start resisting. Resisting. Actively resisting. Now, I'm not talking about if your four-year-old feels bad, you're not supposed to slap them and say, speak the word. Pull it together. But you teach them. You teach them. You say, look, we're going to take care of your symptoms. We love, you know, we talk to them. You're going to be okay. Praise the Lord. But here's what we say. By Jesus Christ, I was healed. Satan, I resist you. Satan, I resist you. Take your hands off my body. Take your hands off my body. My body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. My body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, what if you throw up in five minutes? Say it again. What if it doesn't leave immediately? Say it again. Yeah. Hallelujah. You have to understand the fight of faith. Just because you're fighting a fight of faith doesn't mean you might not have to stand and battle symptoms or, or a weapon that's formed against you, but you're denying the ability and right of it to prosper. You're not letting it take root. If it's touching you in your feeling realm, whether that's offense, whether that's sickness, whether that's any sort of thing that the enemy would try to form against you, you resist him. Resist. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's just like, you know, we should teach our sons and daughters how to resist an attacker if he was to attack them. Amen. I mean, you know, I, I, Kenzie, you think she, she's pretty good at handling herself, and she is. But I talked to her about, you know, if somebody ever grabbed you and tried to throw you in a vehicle or something like that, you know, you've got to, certain things you got to do. You got to know how to resist. Don't just go, ah! You start kicking, scratching, clawing, kick them where the sun don't shine, kick them in the teeth, Kick them in the ear, bite them, whatever you have to do, you do it. You resist. Hallelujah. So, you know, the thing is, is that a lot of Christians never resisted. The, now, if they were in a battle in the day and somebody would pull them, pull them, pull them, get in, a, you'd be like, ah. But when they don't realize it is the devil's forming that weapon long before the moment of the attack. Because he can't just devour anyone. He's seeking whom he, he's looking for permission. He's looking for a door. He's looking for a window. He's looking for something. Where can I, where can I get in? And he's roaming. He's roaming like a lion. And, he, and you know, if you were in Africa or somewhere where lions are, and you were in an encampment, and at night, you could see just beyond the fire, lions walking, 
and going, it'd probably make you have a, an awareness of the danger. But the devil, he'll roar. But if you're safe in your encampment where you know the lion can't get in, you just go, ah, there's a lion. I'm safe and protected in my encampment. See, a lot of Christians, they don't understand that their words can open the door to the attack of the lion. Or your words can keep the door closed to the attack of the lion. Amen? Amen? 